David Waldman. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday, May 12th, 2022. Time for another show. Not that I'm ready for it. Okay, let's see. Make sure we get this all hooked up and got all the alarms set to go. Many things happening this morning. Oh, I'm in a panic because all of my cryptocurrency holdings have collapsed. <laughs> But I don't have any, so I guess it's okay. For those of you who do, well, I'm sorry. But uh, I'm sure that the people listening to this show, if you are holding any money at all in cryptocurrency, were very prudent in their investments. I hope so, because it's bad news for those who haven't, uh, including, I guess, Madison Cawthorn, who I recall uh, this morning, or rather, this morning I recalled his old tweet. And it's not that old. It's only about eight to nine months old, I guess. Just trying to count in my head at the same time. But if I could do that, I'd be rich with cryptocurrency. Anyway, his tweet from September of last year asking, I guess, in all earnest, uh, why we were not using cryptocurrency as the new gold standard, which, I mean, I think was pretty ridiculous on its face when he tweeted it. But now it's just that much worse. Okay, so I don't know what precipitated this whole thing. And I don't know if I'm even going to try to find out. It doesn't matter a great deal to me. It might be an interesting story at some point when we figure out what's going on. But um, I don't know. All of a sudden, like the other day, I saw everybody was complaining about their uh, ape NFTs again. And it's somebody who paid like $350,000 for it. I don't know. Must have sold it off and it only got like a hundred and something dollars for it that sounds pretty funny and then the next day cryptocurrencies collapsed i don't know if bitcoin is doing as badly as the rest of them that's supposed to be like the gold standard of the things that you shouldn't make the gold standard i guess but uh everybody else appears to have collapsed i don't know this is going to devastate my son who uh i think once accidentally had somebody Venmo him some money and he couldn't return it because he didn't know who sent it and couldn't get in contact with the person. It was like 10 bucks and it sat there for a year. So he then bought one of the cryptocurrencies with it and it turned into a hundred bucks, but I guess it's back down to 10 cents or something like that. So no harm done. That's the way to invest in. All you need to do to become a crypto millionaire is have people accidentally give you enough money that you could turn into millions of dollars. And then remember to sell it and capitalize on it uh, soon enough. All right. Well, that's happening. Other things are happening. People are pointing out new and interesting stories for us to share. The war in Ukraine continues. The Russians continue to make technological mistakes in the war in Ukraine this morning, uh, I guess. in This modern warfare type uh, stories put in the folder. The story, I guess, of somebody... Uh, displaying all the phone phones with SIM cards that are Russian wandering around in Ukraine and pointing out, hey, this is a pretty good map of the concentration of Russian forces, I think. Although other people were giving the Russians too much credit, saying, you know, a truck full of phones would look the same way. What a great decoy that would be. And I agree, it would be a great decoy. It just didn't seem to be in the in the Russian playbook. So more modern technology for targeting your... Uh, mobile artillery, I guess. This uh, this never ends. All right. Well, the Kegro in the Morning Radio Show is live now. Bill tells us from Portland, Maine. We'll turn to Greg in just a moment. Once we find out what Bill has by way of instructions for us, Greg. Uh, sorry, folks. The Senate was unable to invoke cloture. So Kegro X isn't permitted to initiate discussion this morning. Oh, whoops. I should have read that earlier. Instead, please enjoy a two-hour loop of Robert De Niro mumbling enthusiasms. We do have that, of course, available for everyone. And uh, Greg, the source of all our enthusiasm, is here. Good morning. Let's begin getting enthusiastic then. Yeah, good morning. You know, why don't we just uh, invoke closure on Armando? It's always a good standby. Right. Well, we've done that, and he, uh, I guess he took it seriously. (laughs) And he hasn't been back in a while. We'll have to invite him in. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the other thing about the uh, crypto thing, Yes. And basically, the reason crypto is falling is because everything is falling. And it's not okay. immune to uh, what the Fed is doing in terms of raising rates. And it's not immune to the stock market. 
And uh, it isn't, uh, you know, a, an isolated thing that somehow can be walled off from everything else. Oh. But it's not just crypto. It's also Tesla that's falling. And that, of course, affects Elon Musk. And that affects his ability to buy Twitter. So, you know, I guess that's uh, a uh, tis an ill wind thing. that blows nobody any good. Uh, and the other right. thing that was interesting about that's... listening to your son's story about going from ten dollars to one hundred to ten cents yes. is uh, it just reminds us that the ba- the way to uh, obtain wealth in this country is to be given it. Yes, exactly. All you have to do is either that or I started from nothing except loan. the uh, three million dollar trust fund my father gave me, and I turned right. it into a two point seven million dollar enterprise. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I mean that's kind of the way it goes. Uh... And uh, if you can, limit it to small amounts of money, like 10 bucks, and we'll all be fine. Right. So uh, in terms of Ukraine, boy, there's some interesting stuff going on. Hmm. Uh, and it isn't just, uh, you know, modern applications of the Ukrainians being very clever about how they do things. We, we've talked about the show off and on. But I got a, uh, a drill down into a specific hmm. incident, which is just fascinating. All but right before then. we get there, uh, Dan something, Lamont, reporter. I don't know. Betting on reporters says yes. uh, U.S. led sanctions are forcing Russia to use computer chips and dishwashers and refrigerators and some military equipment. Oh. So uh, the Russian ordinance is just as deadly, but now it's cleaner and colder, just so you know. <laughs> I guess so. And uh, what happened to all the refrigerators and dishwashers? I wonder. Well, they got uh, you know, they they can't be sold to Russian uh, consumers. Huh. So Russian consumers are now figuring out, hey, the war ah. does have some effects. Yeah, right. Maybe that's it. There's a shortage of all of these things. Oh, you could um, you could lob the chipless dishwashers at Ukrainians if uh, you have the that. right equipment. Hmm. All right. Uh, so economist YouGov poll out uh, yes. shows that people supporting sending money to Ukraine, uh, mm-hmm. 62 to 17. Oh, federal money, not theirs. Our money. Okay. Yeah. And the point there is, I mean, it is uh, theirs, as Justin Tian, who, who tweeted, it says, to the extent that MAGA Republicans are opposed or don't, you know, or America first and don't want to do this, it's going to be one of their single least popular issues. Cool. Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, that comes up a lot. And uh, I think it was a big Twitter fight yesterday between uh, Eye Patch Guy and uh, Empty Green. Yesterday, fighting over, uh, I guess she voted against sending the money and they fought on Twitter about it. So super exciting. Uh, Dan Crenshaw. Dan Crenshaw. Uh, I, uh, eye patch guy. You know who I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the yeah. guy. Dan right. One Eye versus uh, Margie right. Three Name. Yeah, right. So uh, keep an eye on Dan Crenshaw because he needs you to because he's got just the one. Well, he's a more traditional uh, conservative. But, you know, it, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in the politics section about the fascinating. Ah. Uh, you know, stuff that I. bubbles up from the base. <laughs> but going back to uh, Ukraine right now. He voted I on the on – the, all right, just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I only do no, it he because voted I, I. he made, <laughs> he made uh, Pete Arr. Davidson apologize for it. And uh, I don't know. Somehow I'm not going to do it, and that's going to work out great for me. That's fine. You know, uh, uh, Crenshaw, uh, you know, is marginally more acceptable than MTG. Mm-hmm. And so that's the way it is. Uh, so uh, the Institute for the Study of War says, as their uh, uh, overall report of what happened yesterday, yes. Russian forces didn't make any significant advances anywhere in Ukraine. Oh. Pretty good, huh? Nice yeah, day for right. Russia. And the Ukrainian well forces took further ground northeast of Kharkiv, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which we've been talking about. They had counteroffensive there, limited in the sense of uh, you know just that area, but they're basically making it all the way to the Russian border. Okay. Right. Yes. Right. Ukrainian counteroffensive north of Kharkiv city has forced Russian troops onto the defensive and necessitated reinforcement and replenishment efforts intended to prevent further Ukrainian advances toward the Russian border. That means they have to take all the stuff they have in the south and move it up to Kharkiv, which is north. Uh, so uh, they can't uh, use all of their assets to continue on to Odessa or Berlin or wherever the heck they think they're going to do in their fevered minds. And so that's not working out for them. Russian efforts along the southern axis, Donetsk and Luhansk, remain similarly stalled, and Russian forces have not made any significant gains in the face of continued successful Ukrainian defenses. So they're not going anywhere. And now they have to throw, uh, you know, refrigerators and and, uh, dishwashers at them. You know, talk about throwing the kitchen sink. That's next. Oh, yes. All right. 
new right? appliance and, and it's just it's not going that wars. well. But the uh, the Ukrainians are in fact hardware uh, going the other way. All right, um, good for them. The key takeaways: uh, pro Russian telegram sources report a Ukrainian forces may be conducting a counterattack forty uh, kilometers north of Isium to cut off Russian units. Uh, though we Thanks. can't confirm that. We've been talking about that because it isn't just a question of uh, getting, uh, you know, assets back in Kharkiv. And I'm going to send you a map here because this map All right. is the this, one I was looking for the map. other day and couldn't find. Oh. Uh, shows uh, Kharkiv up in the northeast sector, but you could see the little body of water that's hmm. between them and Russia. Yes. And so there's water to be crossed, uh, rivers and, and other things. Hmm. And that's where this next uh, uh, tweet thread, which is just fascinating. So uh, water. And this is a – I've been clear to tell you this, so I'm going to tell you this hmm. story by a Ukrainian military engineer. Okay. Okay. And it goes, he, what I did drawing? to destroy the Russian pontoon bridge – all over right. Siversky, a thread. Siversky. Here you go. This is like an essay he writes. Yeah. What I did. So what I did this summer. I'm okay. a UA, that is Ukrainian Army, mm -hmm. military, engineer, military engineering officer. And I've served one turn in Donbass prior to the recent invasion. Recently, I've accomplished a mission which made huge impact on Russian losses and completely screwed up their plans to encircle hmm. Les Sachengs. Okay, and uh, probably our efforts to pronounce it as well. Uh, do my best. Initially, there was intelligence from frontline units that there were Russians on the other side of the river, and they're gathering various vehicles. So my commander asked on the 6th of May, me, as one of the best military engineers to do engineering reconnaissance, Wow. together with recon units for backup, I go to explore the area on 7th May. Okay. Right. Frontline units in the area report multiple Russian vehicles gathering on the other side of the river. So I explore the area and I suggest a location where Russians might attempt to mount a, a pontoon bridge to get to the other side. Hmm. And oh, I use range finders to figure out the river's 80 meters wide. So the Russians would need eight parts, 10 meters each of the bridge connected to get to the other side because the, the pontoon bridge is built with parts. Yeah. Eight. Right. So, uh, well, it's 80 meters. So you need eight parts, 10 yeah. meters each. I bring an extra part. I would. <clears throat> With that flow of the river, I knew they would need motorized boats to arrange such a bridge and it would take them at least two hours. Hmm. Took me a day to check everything and I had to do it on the 8th of May as well. So I reported the information I had to my commanders. Also, I told the unit that observed that part of the river, they need to be on the lookout for the sound of motorboats. Okay. Now, visibility was shit in the area. Because oh the Russians then put fields and forests on fire, and they were throwing oh, a lot of smoke grenades. That's a good idea. And on top of that, it was foggy. I mean, and our guys had to hear the sound. So on the eighth of May, hmm. right at the place I said, I'm there to check it as well. Okay, and then I see them starting to build the bridge, and I think my recon and hints of the river made the biggest impact. I outplayed the Russian military engineers. Russians attempted to place a bridge right in the place where I guessed. The river didn't the river unit didn't see them, but they heard the motorboats. Aha. Uh -huh. So okay. So the artillery was ready, it was all lined up, it was all aimed, etc. And we've been able to confirm Russians mounted seven parts of the bridge out of eight. Russians have even succeeded to move some troops and vehicles over the river. Combat starts in twenty minutes. Uh Heavy artillery engaged against Russian forces. Aviation chipped in as well. I was still in the area, and I've never seen and heard such heavy combat in my life. After one day, the bridge is down. Russian forces, about 30 to 50 vehicles plus infantry, are struck on the Ukrainian side of the river. No way back. Hmm. They tried to run away using the broken bridge. Then they tried to arrange a new bridge, and aviation started heavy bombing of the area and it destroyed the remains of all the Russians and all the other bridges. And rumors say it's about 1,500 Russians dead. Hmm. Their strategic wow. objective was to cross the river and then encircle uh, Lesetchansk, which I can't they pronounce, they and they miserably failed. Wow. So by the 10th of May, the pontoon bridge completely down. That's about time when you start to get all the picture of the area. And I'm on the ground doing the work there, and I did my part, and I'm proud to serve. Well, all right. And so, you know, it's just – it's an interesting – like this is what it's like on the ground going on here, and here's the kind of things we're doing. 
we know we're not going to be able to see. So we figure out what's going on, and then we tell our uh, our, our uh, fellow uh, uh, soldiers here, listen for the sound of the motorboats. If they try to block it out with fires and smoke, we well, don't know they're going to do that. If it's going to be it's foggy guess, the though. next day, we don't know they're going to do that. It doesn't matter. If you can't see, listen for the sound of the motorboats. Yeah. They did. It worked. Uh, and then he's got pictures of the destroyed bridge. And it's a real story, and it's just fascinating. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, well done there. Uh, Maxime, it looks like his name is, if I'm reading the uh, Cyrillic right. So good job, Max, probably, for short. And uh, interesting tactic, too. I don't know whether it was his plan to let some of the Russians across and then trap them, or whether he wanted to blow up the bridge before any of them got across. But it works out. And uh, good thinking, excellent redundancy built into it. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether he guessed that they might try to obscure the line of sight. I mean, I, well, I guess, you know, that, the, I, guess the old, I would, uh, now that you mention it. Like, luck I'm not is military. 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. So he does yeah. the work, sets it up, mm -hmm. and then they're in a position to take advantage of it. And, oh, how lucky they happen to stumble across those motorboats. Well, more than that. Yeah. It's a good, yeah, it's great uh, advance work, right, to recognize that. A lot of people might know that and maybe would put it in a report possibly, but then it depends on people reading the report. Uh, so that, well done. All right. Great. And uh, too bad for the people who crossed the bridge early and uh, got stuck. I guess they're captured or dead now. Yeah, well, a lot of them dead, I think. Yeah. So uh, well, now we have their SIM cards. Yeah. All right. Well, that's war. Can't that's cheer war. for it too loud, but well done if you're rooting for Ukraine. And if you're so, not, you know, get out of here. And, and again, the fascinating th thing here, as we talked about yesterday, stepping back a little bit, yeah, is the balance that Zelensky is going to have to have with pushing the Russians back, but not pushing the Russians too far. And he's going to have to figure that out. And uh, the uh, U.S. and uh, Europe is going to have to let him take the lead on that. It's interesting because the U.S. is all in on backing Ukraine and the Europeans, of course, are having cold feet because they're the Europeans. Um, the, the Germans are stepping it up while Hungary is stepping it down, afraid of losing Russian oil. Mm, okay. uh, Ukraine has actually cut off one of the pipelines. Russian uh, oil will have to be – or Russian gas, I should say, will yeah. have to be rerouted. You'd think they would. And been. the French are the ones that are most concerned about going too far. They want to be the peacemaker and try to – uh, push negotiations. Well, that's nice. Um, and uh, what the Brits are doing is unclear. Uh, they're still trying to figure out what to do about Ireland uh, uh, yeah. and Northern they're Ireland for because Sweden. of Brexit and also because of the latest uh, uh, Northern Ireland vote, yes, uh, right. which is uh, Sinn Féin, yes. uh, which is uh, kind of interesting. Fein, and, yes. uh, you know, uh, 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 Olivier Knox writes, Russia will take years to recover from the early Ukraine setbacks. All right. Take all the time you need. Okay, he may be dangerous, more dangerous now than before because he's losing. Boom. So he may be tempted to try drastic new steps. That's what everybody's worried about. Yeah, and he's refocused the war aims. He's made them smaller, maybe, uh, but uh, he's not going away. And uh, Russia won't be satisfied. He writes with merely conquering Donbass, even assuming they can, says the director of national intelligence. Uh, ours, Putin aims oh. to occupy southeastern Ukraine, connecting to Crimea build a land bridge to Transnistria, and uh, that's basically his plan. But the conventional military will need years to recover because they wiped out so much equipment. All the tires are gone. Right. And it's going to take him years, uh, said Avril Haines, who's the DNI director. And interestingly, that makes it sound, uh, Olivier Knox writes, like Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's controversial late April expression of hope Russia will be so weakened it can't invade other neighbors, and that may be coming true. And a top right. French military Great. official recently said something similar, despite whatever Macron said. Oh, uh, well. Now, now Putin bets <clears throat> that democracies thing. will weaken before Russia. So he wants yeah. to see Hungary fight with France, fight with England, fight with the U.S. and such. And, you know, it's not happening Ooh, at the might. moment. Biden's holding everything together. And uh, I really, you know, I don't care what you think of him. Uh, but uh, thank goodness uh, uh, Biden is president right now. Yes. Because he's doing a pretty good job in balancing the foreign policy side of things. Yeah, I mean, this is not something you could have left in Trump's hands. Trump would have been a, I mean, still is pro-Russian. You don't have to guess. He's still pro-Russian. And uh, what might that have meant? 
And well, you know, he's behind the scenes quietly getting it done. You know, he's yeah. not out there doing the flashy stuff in front of them. I said that I am That's going true to take too. down North Korea. No. Even without that, even if he were a braggart, he would be doing the right thing. And, you know, here's a good question I hadn't considered. What's the possibility? I mean, no one's ever thought of doing anything like this. But if Trump were still in office and the Russians were still, for whatever reason, doing poorly in Ukraine, would Trump offer the Russians military assistance? Or would he just say, well, they lost. I mean, no skin off mine. I mean, that would be incredible. But I don't know. He's done dumber and weirder things. I don't know if the Russians would accept American assistance, even if we offered it. But I no, guess well, it's possible that he's just that dumb hmm. that he would he would offer. I mean, you know, since since they're uh, uh, building their war hurricanes. machine based on, uh, you know, uh, refrigerators and dishwashers. Yeah. We would oh, offer we America's could. latest. Maybe that's it. Right. We'll in substitute return our for Trump Tower in Moscow. Right. It's a I, fair trade. It's I just a business so. deal. That's it's. Yeah. What's the difference? Right. And anyway, if he didn't Olivia like Knox weapons, writes, he uh, the war is a stalemate until it isn't. Okay. Asked about the state of the fighting. Uh, I would characterize it as the Russians aren't winning and the Ukrainians aren't winning. And we're a bit of a stalemate here. If Russia doesn't declare war and mobilize, the stalemate is going to last for a while. Uh, and even though they may not be as well trained and competent, uh, when they get uh, conscripts, they will still bring mass and a lot more ammunition. So the war is a stalemate until it isn't. Uh, again, our newspapers, yes, particularly Washington Post, New York Times, are very Russo-centric and tend to write everything in terms of uh, and, and the military analysts, uh, especially from overseas, from Australia and the UK, have pointed this out in terms of, well, Russia is going to win. Well, they're going to win right away. Well, if they don't win right away, they're still going to win eventually. Hmm. And they don't uh, credit Ukraine with agency of its own. You know, the, the, uh, we talked yeah, about this well, on the show. It's the right. Mike Tyson plan. You know, everybody's a plan until you get punched in the face. Well, Ukraine punched Russia in the face and their plans just sort of blew up mm -hmm. along with their tanks. Uh, yeah. You know, and so uh, maybe Russia isn't going to win and maybe the isn't going the, to go the way things say right here. Rock em, so, sock em, you know, it's, it's important to keep that in mind as you analyze this. This one is from The Economist, again, from overseas. How rotten is Russia's army? Vladimir Putin uses warfare to make up for Russia's weaknesses. That's why he's so dangerous. And then, of course, it has the famous picture of the uh, tank turret with mm -hmm. this looks like a skull. Yeah. Or a, a brooch. There's. You know, that we're now all familiar with. Horseshoe crab. And the the uh, the picture is credited to the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. I love that. Huh. <laughs> so that you can right? use it all you want to. Well, OK. Freebie for us. Yeah, I, I can see, uh, as you were saying it and reminding us of uh, how Russo-centric the major papers are. I mean, I guess like you, my guess at explaining it would be, I mean, just decades of being told and believing that the main threat to everything, at least in Europe, in terms of European security, was Russia. And that was because they had the massive and efficient army that could win any battle. And it's going to take a long time to shed that. And there's no background on the Ukrainian military or the Ukrainian fighting spirit or anything. You know, we don't have we don't know about that. It was always just Soviet. And then it just was this other thing that had never fought a war. Well, you know, we the know. part of it is that, and certainly part of it is being based in Moscow. I mean, you know, yeah, other right, people too. have pointed That's out the thing. problem with American and Western, but particularly American reporting, mm -hmm. is that it's what does Moscow think? As if, like, there's a whole other part of Russia that's not in Moscow. You know, are you aware of those uh, areas which are very poor and uh, not necessarily uh, Slavic ethnic, uh, where the conscripts are coming from and being yeah. sent to uh, Ukraine. And, and if you don't know those areas, then do you really understand what the troops and conscripts are thinking? Well, and no. it's like trying to explain France, uh, except only through Paris. There are no hotels in these oblasts. I can't go and report from there. Right? Or, or what about uh, trying to explain uh, Illinois only through the pr uh, prism of Chicago? Or, um, you know, let me talk to you about uh, New York, but only from New York City. Uh, upstate New York doesn't really exist. Well, I guess I would say let's use our best resources, uh, you know, or capitalize on our practices elsewhere. Uh, some of you are explaining the United States only through a diner. Can you help us figure out how to get to the Yeah, pretty much, you know, so they, so they get stuck in these, you know, 
ways of, of doing things that just yeah. don't really fit the moment. And I think that's part of the explanation for how come they seem to be so resocentric. Get out of Moscow and yeah. start talking to people yeah. outside of Moscow. Do it like mine. Well, you can't. Anymore, it's dangerous. I get that. Exist. But then don't think that what you hear is the only side of the story. Well, that's true. Um, although you would think that uh, maybe, well, I'm sure if they have a Kiev bureau, it's young and isn't established in the newsroom in terms of its clout. That's not where you hope to get sent as a well. The Kiev bureau is great. I mean, Tim Mack They're has doing been, good he just now. got rotated out, by the way, from oh. NPR. Oh, he's now, so we don't know. Uh, you know, he's in Poland, so he said, "I'm not going to give you my daily, uh, you know, Kiev is still in Ukrainian hands because I'm not there anymore." Hmm. How's Poland doing? It's in Polish hands. Well, we'll hear. He should know, tell us he starts that again. <laughs> Good morning from Bolivia, right. which is still in <laughs> Bolivian morning. hands. Good morning from Warsaw. They still speak right. Polish. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's, I mean, they, they certainly do have those Kiev bureaus now, but they don't have the tradition. And I imagine like uh, with the White House beat, it's it still was considered like maybe a prestige posting, whereas Kiev yes. wasn't. Yes. So, yeah. All right. Well. Uh, so a line of war that'll that, change but, things. You know, read. You know, again, our papers of record have done a marvelous job documenting the humanitarian issues. But yes. when it comes to the well, military part, are, you you really have to search if you can find it at all about what the Institute of War is po uh, pointing out about the uh, uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, which has now been taking place over about ten days. Yes. You hear about it here on the show because I report on it and I report yes, on it you. because others are. But uh, you, you're not hearing it from the Times and the Post. Mm. Well, uh, I'm not doing direct reporting. I'm giving credit to the people who are telling us about this. And that's right. usually the military analysts. Right. And uh, even if they are doing a not so great job on it, they are doing original reporting about the war and we have to rely on them for that. So, all right. So we point out the shortcomings. Uh, OK, let's do it again and point out other shortcomings over the next segment after this. Hi everybody, it's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We're back. Uh, time to do more of this news thing. Well, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about SCOTUS and Roe. Before I do that, though, I, oh. I do want to mention something about the ongoing pandemic that isn't over. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, people are still getting sick with it. So, you right. know, that, that's a big deal. However, famous people even. Uh, and people, you know, friends you and, and uh, other people that, uh, you know, are in your own circle. The thing is that if you step back and remember what the original thinking was when the pandemic started, you could argue that what the federal government has done for good or for ill, and uh, for many uh, ways it's ill because it's too simplistic, but for good or for ill, they said, look, the whole idea here is to flatten the curve so that we can protect our hospitals so they don't become overwhelmed. Right. That was the most important thing at first. Right. Be St. Louis, not Philadelphia. Remember all that stuff. So fast forward to now, and you could argue that, look, we know the pandemic isn't over. The feds know the pandemic isn't over. The CDC knows the pandemic is over. So does the president, even if he attended the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Mm -hmm. But the hospitals are not being overwhelmed at the moment. The phase that we're in, given how many people have already had the virus, plus how many people have been vaccinated, is such that even though we're doing a terrible job of boosting the boosters, hmm. even though we're doing a terrible job of getting people vaccinated and protecting them, yes. on the other hand, the hospitals are not being overwhelmed. So if you think that is our prime job going back to the beginning of the okay. pandemic, we're doing all right with that. Curve flattened. Yeah. 
So, you know, if that's the approach they're taking, you can scratch your head and say, yeah, well, that still leaves a lot of people getting sick, getting long COVID, having uh, issues for the future. You're not exactly protecting us by doing that. But at least they're doing the, uh, you know, the prime thing of keeping the hospitals running. I think that's That's... insufficient, so I'm not happy with it. But, you know, when you step back and look at the big picture, that seems to be what's going on. And that may help explain how come they're saying, look, I know it's rough, but we're still having the White House Correspondents Dinner, and this is the attitude we're taking. Yeah, I mean, you don't really still need to. You never had to have that dinner in the first place, even without coronavirus. Well, yeah, it was always stupid, and now it's even more stupid. Yeah, but uh, that's a good point. I mean, you can at least say, all right, well, if that was the goal, okay, then... I guess mission accomplished on that one. I mean, I think yeah, you don't want to say that because uh, George W. Bush, but you know, mission accomplished oh, I do on that want one. To say it. But yeah, uh, okay, so well done there, and uh, it's good thing we want the hospitals to keep running. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we should have entered a new phase at some point and had come up with a new slogan or well, you know, the downside of, of being more restrictive what is what it does to the economy, and we're already dealing with uh, pandemic-induced inflation and other things, and so you know, politically, we're just not going there. Yeah, Particularly when the right, public just well, doesn't want to follow. I guess. I mean, basically, I guess the message could have been, uh, well, the curve was flattened, and now even if you get it, you probably won't end up in the hospital. You should be careful, but uh, go ahead and go shopping. I mean, well, you know, that's okay. uh, this, the storm is over, Yes, but they're still riptide, so, you know, swim at your own risk. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, sure. People are used to that. Bring a raincoat, you know. It's not thunder and lightning, but, you know, if it rains, you'll get we, wet. We, what are you going to do We're telling that? you now, we don't have enough lifeguards, so be careful. All right. Well, I don't know. Most people's idea of that is uh, Baywatch, and they never run out of lifeguards, so mm. I don't know if they'd get it. But all right. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we just didn't really shift into any new mode, even mm-hmm. though we defeated the hospital. I'm from Kansas. Flattening. I don't know what you're talking about. What's a riptide? Right. Uh, it's that it was a great show, Riptide. Uh, way back in the what late seventies, early eighties, they had a pink helicopter. That's about mm-hmm. all I remember about this show. Right. So uh, Monmouth, let's uh, switch gears here. Had a poll oh, out yesterday, national poll. Fifty-seven percent of Americans say SCOTUS should leave the nineteen seventy-three Roe v. Wade decision alone. Yes. Back leave Brittany alone. Was on. Uh, all right, yeah. Abortion they should, should be 33% always legal, 31% legal with limitations, 26% illegal with some exceptions, and 8% always illegal. Only 8% say always illegal. And, yet, and the 8% is who Alito belongs to. Yeah. And that's part of the issue with his uh, incredibly bad uh, draft uh, opinion, which uh, apparently hasn't changed yet because all the new leaks say that, uh, well, you know, nobody's changed their mind yet. And we don't even know if that's true. Mm. But okay. uh, here it is. And uh, I think one of the things this poll does is uh, reinforce what we were talking about again on the show yesterday. You can look at nuance and say, oh, well, if you uh, slice the thirds, you know, 33 percent always legal, 31 yeah. percent legal with limitations, 26 percent illegal with some exceptions and mix and match them. You can get the opinion that I'm telling you the public thinks, which matches mine. Uh, but that's not really what it is. Right. You you can always say, but for me personally, I think legal with limitations. And so uh, that doesn't mean that 33 percent always legal or radical. And that's the favorite word of the Republicans. The radical Republicans like to call their opponents radical because that way you won't think they're radical. Yes. So they use the radical thing in every sentence about Democrats because they always stay on message. But the point is, yeah, it's really simple. Who decides and should you change it? And who decides? Most people think it's between a woman and her doctor. And should you change things? The public overwhelmingly says no. So you could take all the nuance you want. That's really the bottom line. And uh, so the public supports the idea of not going along with what Alito says. And that's why the Republicans have problems. They know they have problems. We read from uh, Axios the other day about... uh, You know, Republicans worried that uh, they're going to wind up uh, being on the wrong side of the abortion issue politically. And they didn't want this to come up, but it did anyway. And uh, that was a big deal. And that was a problem. And it's still a big deal. And it's still a problem. Uh, Interestingly, my senator, who's very good, uh, Chris Murphy, 
uh, okay. had uh, this piece that Greg Sargent uh, wrote about in the Washington Post. Chris Murphy's urgent abortion warning reveals a hidden GOP threat. Hmm. What is that? Do you believe that once back in power, the Republicans will let a trifling procedural relic like the filibuster stand in the way of decisive, absolute, rapturous triumph? Ah, Chris is that Murphy a doesn't. Question. Oh, all right. Right. If the court overturns Roe, the Connecticut Democrat says once Republicans take control of Congress and the White House, they'll end the legislative filibuster to pass a national abortion ban with a simple majority in the Senate. When the opportunity presents itself, there's no doubt in my mind they'll change the rules. Mm. Now, uh, the thinking behind this is what I think is fascinating. And this is actually a, from a piece by Jonathan Shade that's in uh, New York magazine. Will social conservatives make Mitch McConnell kill the filibuster? And step back and say, okay, the piece is too long. I'm not reading it. All right. Here's the argument. Not. Yes. All right. Mitch McConnell has been very clearly, as somebody said, he's a front stabber, not a back stabber. He always tells you what he's going to do, and then he does it. And he said, I'm not killing the filibuster. I like the filibuster. Okay. And Joe Manchin and uh, uh, Cinema say, we like the filibuster too. But if you try to drill down and ask why, the answer seems to be, as uh, Chade explains it, most logically Occam's razor kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The money side of the Republican Party is a little bit more socially liberal than the radicals who make up the vast majority of the Republican base voters. Yeah, Because the vast majority of the Republican base voters are completely radical. So they're, they're the one-third of the country that's uh, completely on the other side of the two-thirds, uh, Democrats and independents. And they want to do things like make abortion completely illegal. They're the 8%, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is, they're always pushing the Republicans to do things that the people running for office don't necessarily want to do. They don't want to be Todd Aiken if they don't have to be. Hmm. right? They, they don't want to be tagged yes, with the super radical brush if they can avoid it. So the filibuster is Mitch McConnell's way, in other words, of saying to his base, look, I'd love to do it, but I can't. The filibuster. True. You came up with this incredibly bad idea that if we actually ran on that, like, uh, let's say, get rid of the Affordable Care Act and uh, bring back slavery and whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to help you, but I can't because this filibuster won't let me. So that's what. Uh, you know, drives him to say, I'm not changing the filibuster. If I changed the mm -hmm. filibuster, I'd be answerable to the nutcases that make up my base. I don't uh, want that. All right. It's a theory. Good one. So that's uh, uh, Jonathan Chait's theory. And, and actually, it makes as much sense as anything else. Sure. And given that, you know, it allows McConnell to, uh, you know, not go totally radical. The thing is, if uh, the Senate then becomes like 5149 uh, Republican in the next election for the sake of argument yes. or, or worse, will he have the fortitude, strength and ability to stop getting rid of the filibuster if that becomes in the way of making abortion illegal throughout the United States? Mm -hmm. The money people behind McConnell are. Uh, against some of the things that the base wants to do, but they're not necessarily against everything. And they may not. I mean, if you have to count on corporations to be the thing that makes Mitch McConnell keep the filibuster, good luck to you. Because mm. uh, they're completely amoral and they don't think about that stuff. Right. Well, that's a theory. It could it could happen that way. And of course... Uh, but it makes Mitch McConnell McConnell's is, maneuvering on the filibuster yeah. much more understandable. And to a certain lesser extent... Uh, cinema and mansion hmm. like mansion is really conservative but he doesn't necessarily want to be on the line for all of these votes he hates that hmm. so you got the filibuster he's off the hook i sort of although it's not it doesn't seem to be for him for, for him it. in west virginia totally local stuff local only yeah and that's all that matters vote -wise. and that's all that matters to them yeah well uh, it could explain an awful lot. I mean, it certainly I mean, the theory look, look that at, take a, a separate issue. Mark Kelly has been and Title before. 42 All right. and immigration stuff. <clears throat> Mark Kelly, the Democrat, reasonable guy, hates when immigration comes up. He's in Arizona. 
Yes. It's an issue. He'd rather it not be an issue. Right? It's all local. Sure. All politics is local. You know, and, and you can make it uh, national by saying this is a national issue, but, just, just you know, it. depends how it goes locally. You know, and, and that's where, uh, you know, Susan Collins comes in. Maine is not Arizona. Maine is not Kentucky. Uh, yeah. All right. Why so uh, Susan Collins knows that Maine is pro-choice. And so that's why she always does that ridiculous dance of I'm a Republican and I'd like to do everything Republicans want to do, but I have to pretend not to. Yeah. Uh, Whereas right. uh, a mansion is, look, I'm really conservative. I'd like to do uh, everything conservatives do, but I have to do it in a way that protects me. And so uh, I can't go too far one way and I can't go too far the other way. So uh, in that sense, uh, filibusters and, and avoiding votes, you know, is, is what I would prefer. Uh, Chuck Schumer says, well, why don't you write the bill you want for reconciliation and we'll get to it. Right. And Manchin said, I'm not doing that. That puts me, that exposes me. Then then you'll, then my constituents will see what I'm trying to do here. And I don't want that. You write it. Yeah. I'll nibble it. Tell you why it's wrong. Yeah. But, you know, don't put me in the spotlight. That's the exact okay. opposite of what I want. Yeah. I mean, it's so you think about perfect. it that way. It, it, their, their performative uh, uh, behavior in the Senate makes a whole lot more sense. Yes. Okay, I mean it's uh, it does explain quite a lot. It's been like I said, it's been floated before the theory that uh, the filibuster obscures the true preferences of the people in the Senate, and they like to use it that way, and it's helpful for winning re-election, not helpful for doing anything. Right, and that theory, in fact, it's why Chuck Schumer forced a vote yesterday that he knew was going to fail. Yeah, right, and it, and he used to what do they call it the, a. Uh, Messaging. A, a vote to, you know, I don't, I don't know what they call the vote to, to make you go on record. Oh. Well, I forget I, the, the I, I, term for it. Nothing. Uh, but the, in the House, yeah, the show messaging, vote or, messaging or a, bills, yeah. as they sometimes refer to things. A today. message message vote yeah. is what they call it. Uh, that's what we'll say they call it for now. <clears throat> yeah, so. but, you know, it, it, it used to be helpful. It's not helpful anymore mm. because the Republicans – because of the uh, electoral college, say, okay, well, you know, send a message. My yeah. constituents want me to vote the way I'm voting. Right. Well, yes. It doesn't. It doesn't help you Poo. if you're from uh, Nevada. It doesn't help you if you're from New Hampshire. But in Kentucky, they don't care. Yeah. You, you want to make me go on record as voting against abortion? That's only going to help me back home. I guess so. So. Uh. You know, does Roy Blunt worry about going on the record? No. Probably not. Maybe he should, but probably not. Right. So, again, you know, all politics is local in that regard. Okay. Now, here's an interesting little uh, factoid. This is from the New York Times. Why the Justice Department is unlikely to investigate the Supreme Court leak? Uh, okay. Two simple reasons. One, it was a conservative. All right. We know who did it. And uh, so the uh, conservatives aren't really going to push for criminalization of conservative leagues. The other is, uh, as the article says, quote, it's far from clear the justices want agents of the executive branch grilling their clerks and relatives right. and going through the computers in their chambers and the cell phones of their associates, end quote. Can you imagine? Ginny Thomas, sure. give me your cell phone. Yeah. I want to find out who leaked this. She's not what? even in that. What branch? else are you going to find out on there? Yeah. Uh, quickly, quickly, scrub all my I wanted to overthrow the government stuff. Well, what they want, of course, is uh, harassment of liberal clerks. But they forgot that, oh, yeah, well, a thorough investigation would look at both. Oh. Right. And, and by the way, you know, Shoot. again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not the one to say this, but I see experts on Twitter saying, you know what? It's not even criminals. So. Yeah. Right. It's not clear that they're uh, apparently. Maybe immoral, but it's not criminal. What law do they break? At this point, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can make that law, apparently, from the bench. So you could try that no, if you, you get the right case. But somebody has to hand it to you. And uh, my last piece for today is from BuzzFeed, which I just thought was interesting. Julia Reinstein As uh, reporting. Outlet. We spoke to the woman who wrote the chalk message that Susan Collins called the cops over. Wow, a terrorist, really. Well, remember how uh, people were uh, protesting uh, Kavanaugh and somebody said, won't the neighbors get upset? And they said, we are the neighbors. Right. Well, 
You know who wrote the chalk message? A neighbor. neighbor. Yeah, well, who else is going to travel to Susan Collins' house? Quote, it was just two women fed up with not being able to talk to the representative, and it's a beautiful day, so he grabs some chalk and took to the streets. It's a great story. Yeah, good. Right? Collins certainly saw the message, and so did countless others across the country. She called the police. We know she saw it. So the woman, who we shall call Jane, because that's what the story calls her, uh, it was never meant to be like an undercover darkness type thing. It was just two women fed up with not being able to talk. So uh, Saturday afternoon on a public sidewalk outside Collins's home, the two friends wrote, Susie, please, Mainers want the Women's Health Protection Act, WHPA. Vote yes, clean up your mess. So the chalk yeah. message was intended as a last ditch effort to sway Collins. And when asked why she did it, she said, well, Susie Collins hasn't held a town meeting in 20 years. When oh, we email her, when we call her, the meetings. only thing we get is her form letter saying, uh, this is what we're doing this week. And yeah. we're sick of being ignored and dismissed, so we did this. That's a fine thing to do, if you ask me, and I think that's the point of the story. Yeah. No On Saturday, meetings. Jane texted her friend and artist who agreed to join her. Then, like any good millennial, she said, I went on Target and I ordered a 24 box of bold chuck. I've seen them at uh, the stores. I can't believe they're selling, selling these terrorist supplies openly. Right. And then she went by the following day and she saw it had been erased. It wasn't until Monday she read a local news article and learned what happened. Collins had called the cops after which the public works department washed away the chalk. In a statement to the Bangor Daily News, the senator referred to the chalking as, quote, the defacement of public property. End quote. And <laughs> Collins did not respond to a request for comment from BuzzFeed's news. The Bangor Police Department determined the message wasn't threatening. No crime was committed. Right. The police mm-hmm. report described the chalking as intricately drawn in multiple different colors and specify that Collins was the one that called 911 because it was an emergency. Mm, yes. Thanks for wasting our resources and, and uh, not flattening the curve, as it were. Right. So discovering the elected official had quite literally gotten the message erased. Mm. left them but feeling the frustrated message. and unheard. But luckily, the box of chalk was at 24-pack. So on Tuesday, <laughs> she and her friend went back yeah. and filled the sidewalk with even more messages. This is the part you haven't heard about, mm-hmm. about abortion rights. This time, they added another. You might not recognize our right to free speech, but I hope you recognize my right to have an abortion. Okay. Well, Several awesome. neighbors came out, spoke to them as they wrote the messages. They were all incredibly supportive. And additionally expressed their displeasure at their taxpayer dollars and city resources being used to clean up sidewalks. Yeah. Stephen King has a house on the same street, and he Ooh. even tweeted the new messages. You work for us. Yeah. Mainers well, for abortion like rights. say that anyway. So then Collins' husband, lobbyist Thomas Daffron, comes out and confronts them, and he calls them idiots. And in the audio recording, which was reviewed by BuzzFeed <laughs> News, a man identified by Jane as this fellow, her husband, can be heard speaking angrily, accusing the women of defacing my sidewalk yes. and telling him that the chalkings were not doing any good for their cause and wanted to find out oh, who yeah. the lady's employer was, but she didn't tell him. <laughs> Who's your employer? Oh, that's low. And, then, your and then he claimed they called the police because they previously re- received death threats. But she said she thinks it was a bit oh. of an overreaction to a peaceful message. Yes. Well, we were cordial. We were polite. I'm not sure like radical militia types typically write and chalk on sideways, no. on, on sidewalks. And he oh, kept reiterating they've been threatened. Bodies. So then you totally understand how I feel, he, uh, Jane said to him. The idea that you have a right to your own body is all we want to. Yeah. Yeah, right. So he, he went to walk the dog. And when he came back, he was much nicer. He said they should call Collins's office to set up a meeting. And when they said they tried that already, he told them to call again and tell him who we were. We had spoken with him and he would try to make it happen. Ah. So in other words, so it, it worked. worked. Yeah, right. Exactly. So well done there. And uh, yeah, I did see somebody, I, I heard that the message had come back and I saw somebody on Twitter yesterday saying uh, all that she did was guarantee that her cho- sidewalk is going to be chalked forever. Right. Until so if that didn't work, uh, uh, Susan's husband said to them, come back and knock on the door and I'll make it happen. So hours later, they saw him washing the messages away with a hose. They didn't have to call the police. It was easy mm-hmm. enough. Use your own hose. It's really a, a relatively nice story. You know, Maine's a nice place. Yeah, it is it is nice. I knew they had to be neighbors because, of course, everybody knows, like I say, who else would travel to Susan Collins' house to chalk that message, given that, you, you, as you know, you can't get there from here. It doesn't matter uh, who you are, but uh, it would have to be neighbors to do that. So th- I'm glad this story developed, and nothing points it out better than, uh, one, 
her husband coming out and being angry and getting recorded doing it. That's funny. And then all of a sudden he realizes, I have to change my tune. And then what tune is it? The tune is, you win. I'll make it happen. Why don't you call the office and try to set up a meeting? Well, we tried that. It doesn't work. All right, well, I'll intervene for you. Well, why? Because we're doing this. That's why. Right. So uh, the last piece here, last part of it, is that if anybody wants advice from these two ladies in terms of how to make their voices heard, she said, chalk under $3 for 24 colors. Super recommend. Yes. Very good. Reminds me a lot of the old freeway blogger who uh, wasn't directly targeting any houses, but uh, also super cheap communication device, uh, and uh, it gets a lot of attention. So chalk, the highway signs, whatever it is you choose to do, uh, make sure you do it. Don't don't think it won't work. By the way, uh, if you were wondering... What happens to these neighbors if instead of doing the chalk, they just go straight to knocking on the door to ask for a meeting? Call the cops is the answer to that one. And all oh, they, they're trying to break my door down. So they, they handle it exactly correctly, uh, even though they, I'm sure they didn't plot it out. They, they told you the story of it. I just wanted to write the message. I'm right. You invited me to, to knock on the door. So yeah, this is now you threat. can. Right. But had they knocked on the door for why didn't you just knock on the door and try to set up a meeting? Come on. You called the police when I wrote in chalk. What do you think was going to happen when I knocked on your door? It would have been Tucker Carlson's story all over again. Right, They're trying exactly. to break in. Help me. Right. You know, and then the other approach, of course, is Chuck Schumer's approach because somebody asked him, what do you think about all this? He said, yeah. what's a big deal? People protest in front of my house like every day. Yeah. Well, Which right. they do, by it. the yes, way. Yes. Right. Right. It's uh, it's. New York and people have opinions and they're not shy about it. And so mm-hmm. like suck it up and get used to it. Yeah. But we're from Maine. Well, you know, in terms right. of Kavanaugh. Yeah. All right. Well, look, uh, good. I'm glad it worked. It's a great story. I love the fact that, uh, that it all happened that way and that they can speak out and tell other people how they too can speak out. There's lots of cheap ways to do it. Um, doesn't always have to be all that innovative. I mean, you know, they didn't invent anything new there. So give it a shot. Um, now, some senators, I believe, probably do live in places where they would be able to claim to own the sidewalk. There are such places. Well, you know, the point is, don't be threatening. Yeah, right. I mean, or at least right. uh, clear, that's a very you know, protest. That but seems don't be to be an effective way of doing things too, to not have to be threatening. And sometimes, well, so certainly the stories that get reported on with favorable reflection on you. You know, and the other side of the coin is when people say, well, you shouldn't be threatening uh, uh, justices or anybody else. Fine. But that's only half the story. The real thing you should have said is it's OK to protest, but don't threaten people. Yes. You left out the it's OK to protest part. Right. Yes, you do do that. And it facilitates the Republican message, which is that protest is threatening. And uh, but only when you do it, when we do it, it's awesome and patriotic. And so in the uh, the three minutes we have left, I do want to cover this. This is the Axios uh, story from today. Why does it matter? GOP panics over ultra MAGA Pennsylvania Senate wild card. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, influential Republicans in Washington and among the nationwide party elite are having a belated. Oh, crap moment over the previously unimaginable prospect that Kathy Barnett could win the party's nomination. Oh, oh, okay. I have the wrong right. person in mind. Uh, Kathy Barnett is a super MAGA person. Which race are we talking about? She's soaring in the polls ahead. She's just behind the Oz okay. and Senate, uh, the other titan of industry Israel. who's okay. uh, running, whose name I can't even remember. Eh, it doesn't matter. Let's focus on this nut. What McKinley else? McCormick. I think it's McCormick. Mc- Former Rogers, hedge fund McBean. CEO and Army veteran David McCormick. Okay. So it's between Oz. Oz. And McCormick, Oz and McCormick, McCormick yeah. and Oz, and the Bring eighty to one shot is coming up from behind. Yeah, and making ground. Like and the Kathy Derby. Barnett is like really bad, but might win. And so now you have the idea of uh, Doug Mastriano, who's a yes, mastermind right. of the stop the steal thing in Pennsylvania for governor, and then this nutcase for senator. Cool. And that's really making Republicans nervous. Uh, all right. Well, it's hard to call ship. Democrats radical when these are the people. Um, they will though. So don't you know, don't worry about that. If you thrive on listening to them call Democrats radical, you'll still be able to get your fix. Uh, they will do it. Uh, look, I, I I hate having to rely on that. Uh, but I, look, it's beyond my control. If it happens, make the most of it and show everybody what it's all about and what Republicans are really looking to do. It's a, you know, but but boy, I'm going to be nervous until it's all over. 
Right. Uh, meanwhile, the January 6th committee is finalizing witness right. lists and topics. They had a high stakes hearing in June. And we know now that the first hearing will be June 9th. Now we know. Now it can be told. Broad overview of the panel's 10 month investigation set the stage for subsequent hearings. And uh, some people have agreed to talk June 9th. in private, but refused to talk in public. And so they've mm-hmm. interviewed people like uh, uh, the Trump kids. Uh, they want to interview Jeff Rosen and Richard Donahue from the Department of Justice about what was going on there. And uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, May 9th is Victory Day and June 9th is Hearing Day. 6-9, by the way, for all the people who think that's nice. Yeah. You can enjoy that. And uh, we'll see. I hope it doesn't get pushed back any. Right. Yeah. And then Don't finally, really speaking of being that. pushed back, Judge Nix's January 6th plea deal after right wing streamer Baked Alaska <laughs> declares himself innocent. He yeah. goes in for a plea deal. Yeah. And the Which judge means, says, you understand a plea deal means guilty. you're guilty. Yeah. And yeah. and he says, wait a minute. But, I'm innocent. I'm just doing this because I'm <laughs> going to get a better deal out of it. And yeah. the judge says, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Baked Alaska is tweeting the whole thing saying, no, no, that is not how it works. He's exp- he's judge explaining everything. These uh, what did he tweet? It was something like, you know, these MFers really don't know how the court system works, meaning the right. courts. Yeah, I guess. But exactly. Anyway, yeah, you can't do that. You can't have a plea deal where you come in and say, oh, I don't agree to the deal. I mean, you can. Yeah, Emmett Sullivan said, look, are you pleading guilty because you're guilty? And he said, no, I'm pleading guilty because I'm innocent. <laughs> Go, yeah. No, that's not how it works. Yeah. Uh, Think about it. Go talk uh, to your lawyer. We'll do this again. I mean, it's funny because it it is kind of how it actually works. But no, you have to go in and tell the story that the court actually is supposed to care that you're not just looking for a deal. And so they did. And I guess this guy just didn't know that they really cared about the truth. So, whoops. I mean, you do have to you know, go in there and solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. And if, the, if then you say I'm guilty, but you don't believe it, that's a bad thing. All right. Well, we'll see you on uh, next week, Monday. Yeah. All right. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. Update from Canada, where they too have flattened the curve, but the curve has flattened some of them back. Ricky tells us all the way from PEI that uh, it's even further north than Portland, Maine, by the way. Uh, yeah, quite a ways, too. I've driven that route. At any rate, uh, the hospitals, uh, I guess, are, aren't being overrun by patients, but she says... In some cases, the hospitals are being overrun in reverse. Underrun, perhaps, is the way we could put it. Maybe they're overrun with staff shortages made worse due to COVID. Just about all of my dialysis nurses have had it. Uh, so, again, yeah, I'm not even sure what we're talking about at the end there. I have, have had COVID or they've just had it with being dialysis nurses and they're out of there because that's happening in a lot of hospitals, too. And sometimes it's because of COVID and the way they get treated when they actually have it though i imagine that's not the case perhaps in canada where they have the national health care and it's not as big a deal and you're not going to get fired for taking time off when you're sick with covid and you work in a dialysis hospital so hopefully they are uh you know out there uh taking care of the nurses and that they've had it means they've had COVID and been successfully nursed by others through it and are back on their feet. But but during the time when they're out, they're out. Nothing you can do about that. And, uh, man, okay, uh, that's a possibility too. And uh, problems can develop for the hospitals from either side, supply side or demand side, right? We supplied too many sick people, we overrun the hospital. Or is it that there's more people coming in demanding care Whereas the supply of care is another way of uh, ruining things, too. Yeah, I think that's probably the better way of explaining it. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. Um, uh, Which direction can we go next? Oh, yes. You know, uh, I wanted to turn around and maybe take a look at what Rebecca Romans had sent to us, a Molly Jong fast tweet. Always a good bet. Uh, with a New York Times article attached, that just raises the odds, increases the odds that we'll actually read this crazy thing. And she thought it would be a good idea to focus on today. Let's give it a shot. 
Molly tweeting, American democracy could die right here. Let's find out where and why this thing is. Oh, look at this. The latest latest uh, trend on the laptop is to open everything twice into two tabs somehow. Uh, I must be. Uh, m- maybe the double click thingy is overly sensitive. Where, where in particular could democracy die? And the answer is Georgia. Uh, always in danger quite honestly, of dying in Georgia. And this story from the New York Times uh, by Barbara McQuaid, titled, The Most Pivotal Elections in 2022 Are Not the Ones You Think. Or, as you know, I always read these things with an extra dose of paranoia. Not the ones you think, because you're so dumb. Now, read my article. I do hate that construction of headlines. Why isn't it the ones I think? Let me see. Uh, Is it because... I think the, well, 2022, because I think uh, a Senate race is the most pivotal one or something like that. Well, guess what? As it happens, it's probably the ones that we've thought about for a long time as being the most pivotal. And Barbara McQuaid just isn't willing to give us the credit for thinking that way. Although uh, whenever you have it, then you have a fight about something like this and everybody says, but the, the uh, authors of the articles very rarely have any control over what the headline is going to be. Someone completely different does that. Well, that person is a jerk then. Just that I don't know who it is. But if I find out, I'm writing in chalk outside of their house because that works. What's happening? The ones that you, the ones that you, you dummy, think are most central or what do they say? Most uh, pivotal. Uh, well, no, you're wrong. What's most pivotal is illustrated here in the photo that comes with the headline and the, the caption tells you Jody Heiss is the person in the photo here along with Donald Trump. Jody Heiss, a candidate for Georgia Secretary of State with Donald Trump. That's what the caption says. Mr. Heiss has said that, quote, I believe with all my heart, whatever there is of it. The will of Georgia voters was subverted in 2020. Uh, and we can already guess what the whole story is because we already thought this, even though the headline says we didn't think this. But yes, running for Secretary of State, as is the case with Jody Heiss, there and in a lot of states, uh, it will be pivotal to determining the outcome of a lot of races if they decide to cheat. Now, why don't you think this? You do think this. Why does Barbara McQuaid or whoever wrote her headline think you don't think this? Because they weren't paying attention that this is, we're coming on 20 years, I would say, of at least the Daily Coast community, which is routinely dismissed as uh, hopelessly naive, radical, etc., whatever, by the, the right wing and, 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 and lot, tagged as a hate site and all the, all the various stupid conclusions other people have come to about this. For 20 years, the Daily Ghost community has been telling itself and telling anyone who will listen that those races are, in fact, pivotal. Like going back, I would say, to post-2004 election when it was the talk of the site for a considerable amount of time, sometimes more rationally, sometimes not. But the talk of the site that Ohio in 2004 had seen its vote somehow manipulated and that the evildoer behind it all was then Ohio Secretary of State, what was it, Mike Steele. Is that when he was, is that where he came from? Do I have the the name correct? Is that right? I can't even trust my own memory here. But... Um, let me see, uh, just check my own memory here and say Michael Steele, uh, who later became Republican national committee chair and who also, by the way, became interestingly enough, something of a never Trumper, as I recall. Um, but when he, he was the secretary of state and then afterwards it became like a pivotal election thing on the daily, on daily coast and the surrounding blogosphere that the Republican candidate, I guess, if I don't know if he was running for re-election or what, but that uh, that was a pivotal race and things had to be, you know, we, Democrats had to be mobilized to win that race. And probably in other states, this was likely the same. So 
for 20 years, you know, the dirty effing hippies have been saying, yeah, those Secretary of State races are pivotal. And they've done it with greater and lesser intensity along the way. But it's something we've known for some time. Even this specific race in Georgia, it's been known for some time. And by the way, it's because we've been reading Barbara McQuaid's articles and other people publishing similar news in the New York Times and elsewhere. I don't know why they keep saying that we don't know this. You keep reporting it. We keep reading it. People keep paying you. And then you keep insisting that we're too dumb to know this. I I hate that kind of headline, but that's not that's not the central part of this piece, I don't think. Barbara, please tell us more about it. Barbara McQuaid, by the way, not by trade a New York Times reporter. This is an opinion piece. McQuaid is a law professor at University of Michigan. So she almost certainly had nothing to do with the selection of this title. However, you should pick up the phone and complain because it makes you sound condescending when you might not be. On the other hand, you are a law professor. You might be a very condescending person. I don't know, actually. But anyway, the news or the opinion. The fate of our democracy doesn't hinge on the battle for the House or the fight to control the Senate, but on state elections for a once sleepy office, secretaries of state, which you've known for 20 years. Maybe Barbara actually knows that. Maybe Barbara was the one telling us that we needed to do this in Ohio in 2004 and 2005, for all I know. No elected officials will be more pivotal to protecting democracy or subverting it than secretaries of state. While their responsibilities vary from state to state, most oversee elections, a role in which they wield a tremendous amount of power. Secretaries of state own the bully pulpit on voting and they control the machinery of elections. They also have a platform to spread disinformation, such as false claims that voting by mail is not secure. A Republican Secretary of State could reduce the number of ballot boxes or polling places in Democratic areas and limit staffing to create long lines that dissuade potential voters. They can also refuse to certify the results in particular counties or even the entire state. In a close presidential race, if even one Secretary of State in a swing state were to put his thumb on the scale, we could see an election that really is stolen. This has happened before. In 2000, Catherine Harris, Florida's Secretary of State, halted the recount process and certified George W. Bush, for whom she served as campaign chairwoman, as the winner of Florida's electoral votes. But our current political moment is even more fraught, as Donald Trump casts doubt on the last election, whipping his supporters into frenzy, while Republican field generals quietly maneuver conservative hardliners into positions of power. Before we even get to this, by the way, um, do they end up talking about this? I don't know. Well, you know what? We'll read on and see whether it gets mentioned. You can't mention everything. It's not her fault. Uh, but uh, that's our job is to mention everything else. She never gets around to Ohio in 2004. But uh, by the way, we were able to make a story of it in 2004 in Ohio uh, at Daily Coast. Um, in large part because people had seen it before. They had seen Catherine Harris in 2000. And a great reminder here that she does all of this not only as Secretary of State, but having served as George W. Bush's campaign chair for the state. So she's got a vested interest in one of the candidates winning that goes beyond just being a member of that candidate's political party, but to have personally led the campaign in that state. It would be a uh, a blow to her prestige and her climb up the ladder if she were not able to deliver Florida for Bush. So, you know, you just manipulate what you have to manipulate in order to make it work. And there are more and less legitimate ways of doing it. And, and in fact, some of the ones that she listed here are among the, the more legitimate. I mean, they're wrong and they should be illegitimate, but they are considered to be legitimate because we put them purposefully within the power of the secretary of state, the decisions about where the ballot boxes or voting machines will go and where staffing will be uh, 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 adequate and where it won't be and where the old broken machines go and how many machines per polling place and how many polling places per, uh, per town or what have you, uh, all within the purview of the secretary of state. But 
certainly subject to abuse. Then, of course, there's even more radical approaches to it, which uh, maybe we'll get around to when we read one of the other articles or one of the digests of the uh, newly revealed tweet, uh, not tweets, but uh, uh, emails that we discussed yesterday from um, John Eastman and some... I, we need to go back over those again. I tried my best, but I think we maybe failed to explain just how egregious what he was proposing actually was. All right. Back to this article, though, by way of laying the groundwork. Um, and I skimmed over and I don't see here now that we're sort of kind of focusing on Georgia because Jody Heiss is running for secretary of state there. We might as well point out that this is a running problem for Georgia. The current governor, Brian Kemp, was elected on a ballot that he oversaw. You all remember the Stacey Abrams story, right? He was elected governor of Georgia on a ballot that he oversaw as the then Secretary of State of Georgia. And Stacey Abrams was sometimes a little cagey about it, sometimes a little more direct about it, but pointing out that in the end, the interpretation of how the vote should be counted, where things begin to get a little less legitimate when you start to say things like, all right, I did everything I could to limit ballot boxes in black areas of the state so that people inclined or that I think are inclined to come out and vote for Stacey Abrams just don't do it. But on top of that, you find things like uh, anybody whose envelope on their uh, uh, absentee ballot has a corner bent in. Those things we're just going to decide under the uh, auspices of our office as secretary of state that those are going to be thrown out unless of course it's the other corner that's folded because that one happens to be a republican ballot right so but you can choose to say this is a valid vote that's not a valid vote you can't if you don't stop them in the front line by limiting the number of ballot boxes or drop sites or voting machines in black areas then once the, all right fine they got through and they cast votes what can we do to pare down the number of votes that we oh, from those areas that we actually have to count you can do that, too, as Secretary of State. And now he's the governor. Poof. Whatever. All right. So back to the article here. 27 states will choose a Secretary of State this fall. And in 17 of those states, at least one of the Republican candidates for, office, for the office actively denies that President Biden won the 2020 election. That's like the hottest thing to say if you're running as a Republican for Secretary of State. Fourteen candidates have formed the America First SOS Coalition, whatever the hell that's supposed to be, which aims to, quote, reverse electoral fraud by eliminating mail-in ballots, requiring single-day voting, and committing to aggressive voter roll cleanup, end quotes. Measures that could suppress thousands of Democratic votes. If they win office, Republicans will control the voting process in these five crucial swing states, where the 2024 election may be decided. One of them, Georgia, where the Republican incumbent, Brad Raffensperger, is fighting for his political life in the May 24th primary after having refused Mr. Trump's demands to, quote, find the 11,780 votes he needed to overturn Mr. Biden's victory in that state. Although Mr. Raffensperger withstood Mr. Trump's efforts in 2020, he has now joined the crusade, warning against the threat of voter fraud, supporting Georgia's restrictive new voting laws and citing, quote, voter confidence as the, quote, number one issue American voters face. In other words, uh, the great hero, Brad Raffensperger, absolutely would not have made the same decision and will not make the same decision in 2024 if he's still secretary of state that he did in 2020. Remember, I've been saying for a long time, and you know, I'm a kook, so don't listen to me, but I've been saying for a long time that he absolutely wanted to comply with Trump's demands. He just felt that the state of the law would leave him exposed potentially to very serious criminal charges if he went ahead and did this and the whole thing didn't work out in the end. He could be, and even if it did work out for Trump, he'd be sitting on the bubble waiting for a pardon which might never come. Like you might think if he really believed that it would work, then he would just make Trump president. And if he was worried about the state of the law such that he would find himself charged criminally, he would just he'd get a pardon from Trump for having done him this favor. But remember, I mean, maybe this, you know, maybe this is beyond his thinking. I don't know. Maybe he just worried about something else. 
But it would be very wise. I would be very impressed, quite frankly, if Brad Raffensperger considered that and then said, yeah, but it's Donald Trump. Any other person or well, other people ordinarily wouldn't consider going this far and saying, yeah, I'll promise you a pardon. But if they did do that, they would probably follow through and grant that pardon. Donald Trump would just as soon not do it. I'm not certain what his rationale, if there is one, is for that. But he would it's very likely that Donald Trump would end up abandoning you and you'd be sentenced to prison and you'd be sitting there saying, well, then I'll, I'll tell my story and that'll show him. But you'll be doing it from prison and he won't. So. You know, he probably he might have considered that and said, that's why I'm not going to do it. But now that the state of the law is such, thanks to the Republican controlled legislature there, that he could get away with finding those votes. He probably would. All right. Well, anyway, his main primary opponent goes even further. Representative Jody Heiss, a former pastor endorsed by Mr. Trump, is an election denier who has said that I believe with all my heart that the will of Georgia voters was subverted in 2020. Republicans have held this office since 2006. So most likely one of these two men will be in control in 2024. In Michigan, state number two here, the Democrats are in a stronger position. The Democratic incumbent Jocelyn Benson will face uh, Christina Caramo, I don't know if she pronounces it that way, but I will. A community college instructor endorsed by Mr. Trump this fall. He doesn't even know what community colleges are, of course, but whatever. Ms. Benson, a former election law professor, literally wrote the book on the role of secretaries of state and the role they play in protecting the democratic process and resolutely withstood challenges to Michigan's 2020 election. Her opponent, on the other hand, has made debunked claims that she witnessed election fraud while observing poll workers in Detroit in 2020 and said that the Capitol riot was conducted by Antifa posing as Trump supporters. Mr. Trump has been stumping for Ms. Caramo for a reason. This is not just about 2022, he said at a recent rally. This is about making sure Michigan is not rigged and stolen again in 2024. Recent polling shows Ms. Benson with a 14-point lead over Ms. Caramo, but that margin is small considering Ms. Benson's greater name recognition. In Pennsylvania, the Secretary of State is appointed, so the toss-up governor's race will decide who ends up overseeing elections, while the Democratic contender for governor, Josh Shapiro, the state attorney general, has made voting rights a cornerstone of his campaign, some of the Republican candidates seem determined to undercut them. Recent polling shows State Senator Doug Mastriano, a retired Army colonel like Gaddafi, with a Ph.D. in history, maybe like Gaddafi, I don't know, leading the rest of the Republican candidates. Mr. Mastriano has embraced Trump's claims of a stolen election. So you just failed history, dude. Anyway, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer, he spoke with the president in the days after the election and pushed for a new slate of electors to be sent to Congress. Videos show him and his wife wandering through the barricades after rioters, some of whom he'd paid to send to Washington, breached the Capitol. His election as governor is a strong possibility in a state that tends to seesaw between Democrats and Republicans, at which point we would declare this Whiskey Rebellion too and conquer Pennsylvania. That's my suggestion. Other candidates for Secretary of State include Mark Fincham in Arizona and Jim Marchant in Nevada. Mr. Fincham, a state representative who attended the Stop the Steal rally in Washington last year, has introduced a resolution to decertify the results of the 2020 election in three big counties and a bill to empower the Arizona legislature to reject election results, just like Eastman was suggesting everybody do in his memo and emails. As of the end of the first quarter, Mr. Fincham led all other candidates in the race in fundraising, making him the most likely to win the Republican primary and a strong candidate in the general election. Mr. Marchant has followed the same campaign playbook in Nevada. Former state legislator, he has not only called it almost statistically impossible that Joe Biden won the state, but also said he would not have certified Nevada's slate of electors had he been Secretary of State in 2020. Indeed, he pushed for his state to submit an alternative slate. While Nevada has gone to the Democratic candidate in the past four presidential elections, three of its past four Secretaries of State 
have been Republicans, and this race could go either way. For Democrats to fend off the America First slate, they will need to invest in these races, helping candidates build the name recognition they need to combat the onslaught from the right. That'll take time, money, and a strategy to raise awareness about the crucial role of these offices play in protecting our democracy. A nationwide effort like the SOS Project, which was started by a group of Democrats following the 2004 elections, woo, SOS, by the way, not just Save Our Ship, but Secretary of State, started after the 2004 elections and folded several years later, could help. Uh, if it wasn't that it had folded several years later, but something like it could. Individuals can also help by volunteering for Secretary of State candidates and by talking to their neighbors and on social media about the importance of these positions. Races for other offices may attract bigger names, but elections for Secretary of State may bring about the most significant shifts in power in 2022. As Mr. Trump has said, sometimes the vote counter is more important than the candidate. And that's an important point. Uh, who who decides, just as it's important in abortion and the Supreme Court and everything surrounding it, who decides what's going to be a legal vote is just as important as the number of votes that get cast. You can change the outcome by changing what counts as a vote. So let's uh, move on, although uh, the next break is coming to other um, views of these things and uh, see if we can't clarify uh, what we've got here. Let me read you which one's shorter. Let's see. I'll take a look quickly and see if I can figure out which one I can cram in and which one I can't. Uh, Why don't we try and cram in the Talking Points memo piece by Josh Kovensky about this thing. Eastman the Mathematician. MAGA lawyer advised lawmaker to make up formula to throw out Biden votes. This is another way you can do this stuff after the fact if your voter suppression stuff doesn't work well enough. Trump attorney John Eastman had a plan to switch Pennsylvania from Biden to Trump in the final days of 2020. Have state legislators count the votes just a little bit differently. In Eastman's case, newly released emails show he wanted to have the legislature use a formula he devised that, in his words, would leave the state with a significant Trump lead. It's a variation on the age-old and apocryphal Stalin quote that, quote, it's not who votes that counts, but who does the counting. Yes, that's, I guess, if this is not, I guess they're saying it's not really a Stalin quote, but it's attributed to him and Donald Trump former president of the United States, campaigning again for the presidency, quoting that very Stalin-like quote, uh, but quoting it approvingly. It's a variation on that, of course. The emails were obtained via a Freedom of Information Act request from the Colorado Ethics Institute, first reported by the Denver Post. The emails stem from Eastman's time as fellow at the University of Colorado at Boulder in 2020. He made the suggestion in an exchange with Pennsylvania State Representative Russ Diamond, who had contacted the conservative law professor on December 4th after seeing Eastman testify before the Georgia State Senate, two of the states that Barbara McQuaid just brought up. Diamond wanted to know whether the supposedly unlawful election gave the state legislature the right to exercise its plenary authority to appoint presidential electors, regardless of restraints existing within Pennsylvania's constitution and statutes. And the fact that they had declared that they would use an election to determine this and had already had that election I would add Diamond forwarded Eastman a draft resolution that he had written. It would declare that the state's General Assembly had found the election to be unlawful and that therefore the state had failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law and could not determine which candidate won. Eastman replied the same day with several edits. The main one was to suggest that the legislature be more aggressive. Not only should the state legislature declare the election invalid, Eastman wrote on December 4th, they should choose a new slate of electors for Trump. Do you want to go only halfway and require another resolution to actually choose a slate of electors, or should you do it all in one resolution? I don't know the dynamic of your legislature, so I can't answer that, but my intuition is that it would be better to do what you need to do in one fell swoop. Eastman added that Diamond should add a section to the resolution that included factual findings. And that's in quotes, of course, because they're not factual. Uh, And they might even be findings. Based in part on hearings held before the Pennsylvania State Legislature the week before. 
Trump himself appeared at the hearing via his attorney's cell phone. You remember that one? Which was held up to the mic for state legislators to hear. The president proceeded to complain that nobody would overturn the election for him. And he used the word overturn. Eastman went on to articulate a series of claims that the legislators could make to do just that. Why not just prorate the vote totals, ignoring a certain subset of mail-in ballots? More information and detail on this after the break. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue on with this TPM piece, which I had mistakenly. I really knew this wouldn't work. Would fit inside the time I had left before the break. Now we'll just carry it over, and that gives us plenty of time to we yeah, right to uh, walk into the next couple pieces here. Uh, all right, where were we? Uh, yes, right. Eastman goes on to articulate a mathematical solution to this whole thing. If you can't uh, uh, declare the election null and void, why not just declare the numbers to mean something completely different? Why not redefine how the numbers are calculated? If uh, Biden has 10,000 votes and uh, uh, Trump has 8,000, why not say, well, sure, that's true, but that's only if you count all the invalid illegal votes. And now here is a way to get rid of some of these things. Now, if it were simply throw out all the mail-in ballots, that, you know, I mean, that would be dirty politics, uh, but perhaps still within the purview of the Secretary of State. The thing is they weren't really sure whether or not throwing out all the mail-in ballots and all the absentee ballots would actually end up with a Trump win versus a Biden win. Uh, so, you know, they couldn't just rely on that. So he has to come up with this formula. And here it's laid out. Eastman went on to articulate a series of claims that the legislators could make to do just that, that is, come up with a different result. Why not just prorate the vote totals, ignoring a certain subset of mail-in ballots? Not all of them, just some of them. For example, depending on how many ballots were counted that were received after the statutory deadline, say 10,000, for example's purpose, those 10,000 votes need to be discarded, and you can take the absentee ballot ratio for each candidate in the counties where late-received ballots were illegally counted and deduct the prorated amount from each candidate's total, Eastman wrote. It's not just find out which ones were received afterwards and get rid of those, but do an extrapolation. In other words, basically exactly the kind of mathematics that Republicans usually complain, always complain is invalid in taking the United States census, where they believe that a certain minority population uh, or certain minority populations that either are traditionally undercounted or have reason to try to want to be undercounted, perhaps, uh, or where their interviewers have been unable to reach people where there's questions. They rely on mathematical formulas to try and extrapolate the more likely actual population of the area. And Republicans say, no, 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 that can't work. The mathematical thing is just garbage. You either contact the people or you don't. That's the only methods you can use for counting people in the census, the end. 
You can't just make these assumptions. However, when it comes to something that actually affects like day-to-day, I mean, the census affects day-to-day life, but in a far more abstract way. It has to go through 16 layers of policymaking first, but it does have a big impact. But in actually choosing the president of the United States or whatever else, the the various other things that were on the ballot at the time, uh, that's much more direct. And if you can't extrapolate on the census, then... Logically speaking, you can't extrapolate on the elections either, but to hell with logic. They're gimmitarians. Here you can, there you can't. That's all there is to it. I want it here and I don't want it there. But listen to how crazy it gets. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, like he says, uh, if there's 10,000 votes after the statutory deadline, you can get rid of those, but then I don't even understand exactly where he's going here. You take the absentee ballot ratio for each candidate in the counties where late received ballots were illegally counted. Another issue there. And deduct the prorated amount from each candidate's total. And to be honest, I bet he didn't even know whether that really was going to come out in Trump's favor or not. But he might have had a good guess. He might have turned out to be right, but... He probably didn't actually know. But by the way, yes, one of their chief complaints, of course, is that during the COVID pandemic, when it was very difficult not only to get your ballots into people's hands and then back into the hands of the authorities to count them because everyone was isolating, and the mail system was running kind of funky, and through no fault of your own, or uh, perhaps through the intentional planning of Louis DeJoy and Donald Trump, you could mail an absentee ballot with what would ordinarily, under normal circumstances, have been plenty of time left before the statutory deadline and still find it delayed and therefore not counted if the statutory deadline was enforced the same way. However, uh, there were lots of last-minute appeals to local judges who said, yeah, you know, as long as it's received by X number of days after the election and is otherwise uh, unopened and untampered with, yes, in the interest of letting everybody get their votes counted in the middle of a pandemic, we find it constitutional, legal, and uh, on solid ground to say, yeah, the local boards of elections in these counties can extend that deadline. Uh, Eastman said from a maximalist position, no, the date is the date and that's all there is to it. Pandemic or no pandemic, there's and, and further that local elect boards of elections had no authority to extend the deadline and it had to be the state legislature that would extend the deadline, even though in many of these states, it was often the case that the state legislature had had delegated that responsibility to the local elections boards. But we want to undo it retroactively because something, something constitution. That's, that was the big theory that not only can they take back their permission to local elections boards to change the date if necessary, but they also can take back the whole election if they don't like the results and just choose a different answer. Eastman is still sort of using half measures here saying you can change you can keep the election, keep the um, the veneer of elections. You should just change the vote total. Later on, when that doesn't work, he also advocates for saying, all right, you can also just rescind the whole election because you have that plenary power as the state legislature, which almost no one but people on his side believe to be true and probably won't believe to be true if it's if we're ever exercised by a Democrat, they would say, no, that's totally invalid. There's no support for that in the Constitution whatsoever. But at the moment, they need it, so they say it's true. Uh, let's see. There's further detail in here and in the other uh, tweet thread I wanted to share with you. In an emailed statement to TPM Wednesday, Diamond put distance between himself and Eastman's ideas, writing, at no time did I consider presuming any alternative count of the popular vote in Pennsylvania. In the January, I'm sorry, December 4th exchange, Eastman floated another option that had to do with verification. Why not just apply the, quote, historical rejection rate for ballots and then discount each candidate's totals by a prorated amount based on the absentee percentage those candidates otherwise received? I don't know if it's further explained in here, but I think that 
the tweet thread I have later explains it a little more clearly. So maybe we'll leave that for there. But if you're catching the idea here, this is an even dumber extrapolation that he attempts to impose. Uh, that, Eastman pointed out, would leave Trump with a lead in the state, therefore bolstering the argument for the legislature adopting a slate of Trump electors, perfectly within your authority to do anyway, but now bolstered by the untainted popular vote, except that it's been tainted. He just tainted it. That would help provide some cover, he added, and people are focusing on that. Cover? What would you need cover for if you were doing the right thing? Diamond replied to Eastman the same day, thanking him for the ideas while complaining about the Trump team. Honestly, the Trump legal team was not exactly stellar at Pennsylvania's hearing, failed to provide the affidavits for their witnesses, and made a glaring error by purporting that more ballots had been returned than mailed out, he wrote. It is for this reason that I so latched onto your comments that actual fraud is irrelevant when the election itself is unlawful. Aha. I get it. Diamond tried to separate his efforts in 2020 from those of Eastman in the statements to TPM. Professor Eastman was but one of many individuals I interacted with in the aftermath of the 2020 election. I believe the emails in question pretty much compromised, or sorry, the comprised the sum of our interactions. Diamond added that he continues to believe that jealously guarding and preserving the legitimate authority of the Pennsylvania General Assembly should always remain a priority. Basically, Diamond's position here is, okay, you have been unable, and the whole Trump team has been unable to prove the fraud that they allege. At least they still have this other theory, which says that if there's uh, unlaw, if the election itself is unlawfully held or the election is unlawful, uh, then we can determine who the slate of electors are going to be. I mean, that stands on better grounds, except, you know, how do you get to the point where everyone will agree? No one will ever always agree. But how do we get the, the people who count, the judges, if we're still counting on them as legitimate people, to declare the election illegal? And again, the theory was, well, the Constitution says that the state legislatures get to choose how the state electors will be chosen. And you know, two parallel theories running there. One is that what that means somehow, they interpret that to mean, oh, what that means isn't, as we've explained before, that the legislature gets to choose the method of selecting the electors and every state currently, and for many years uh, since whenever, have always said that method when it comes to selecting electors for the president of the United States, will be popular election within this state. I don't know when the last time was, or if there even was a time, I'm sure there must have been at some point in the early days, when the state legislature simply said, well, we will select the electors directly. There will be no election in this state for president of the United States. I don't know if any other methodology has ever been used. There are, you know, you can pick anyone you want, I guess, so long as the legislature approves it. I think it's probably been limited to popular election. And if there's ever been anything else done, direct election by the state legislature, the way they used to directly select the Senate before the mm, 18th, Amendment, which would have been 17th Amendment. I can't remember which one it was uh, uh, for direct election of senators by the by the people. You remember. OK, anyway, uh, the point is that there there, as I said, two parallel theories, one which says that if the legislature chooses to have an election, but then the election somehow is invalid or illegal then the only alternative we'll have in order for our you know, people to be represented at the Electoral College is to select the slate itself. So how can we get to declaring the election illegal? And the theory was that that clause, which gave the legislatures the opportunity to choose the method by which the electors will be selected, actually means something completely different. In their view, it actually means that the only body that can set the date for the election, uh, although I guess they don't have much choice in the general election, 
but the only body that can uh, make any of the rules surrounding the election, uh, the times that the polls will be open, the number of polling places that there will be, whether or not they'll use voting machines of this kind or that kind, paper or no paper, receipts or no receipts, ballot boxes, whether there will be drop boxes, whether absentee voting will be allowed and under what circumstances, what will happen to people who stand in line before the polls close, but the polls close while they're waiting in line. All of those decisions, can you give them water, etc., have to be made directly by the state legislature and no one else, that they are undelegable to any other body. And if those jobs are delegated to another body, not that doesn't just negate the rule, it potentially renders the whole election tainted and illegal and unconstitutional and and throws the whole thing to the state legislature. We said there has to be an election and it should be done this way, et cetera, et cetera. And a local government, a local board of elections said, well, if you get online before closing time at 8 p.m., you're eligible to vote. We say, you know, we didn't say anything about that at all. They might even not have addressed it. I guess if the legislature specifically said, no, the last vote counted is the one that's dropped in the box at 759 at eight o'clock. Doesn't matter whether you've been in line for three hours or not. You're out. If they said that, that would probably stand. But they rarely do say that. Instead, they leave it up to the local elections boards in many cases, not necessarily, you know, closing time when that tends to be statewide. They want to kind of. Um, um, uh, uh, harmonize those laws, but others about where the polling places will be and how many machines will go there. That's minutia that they leave up to the local boards of election because they don't want to have anything to do with it. Now the theory, though, becomes, well, because we didn't set all those rules, that renders the whole thing illegal. I mean, that's a very convenient outcome, right? Oh, no, we lost the election. I want to cast... Uh, I want the electors to be Trump electors. How can we do it? Well, what about this? Right here, it says that uh, one local board of election allowed somebody to walk their dog and drop their ballot in the ballot box. And uh, we didn't say dogs were allowed at polling places and a drop box is going to be considered a polling place. So the whole election is illegal and we select Trump. That's the essence of what they're trying to do here. So now, of course, Diamond is uh, trying to distance himself from it. But there's right. So that the, that was theory one. Theory two was, well, skip the whole thing and just say no matter what happens, even if the election isn't illegal in any way and we got nothing, it's still my interpretation of the Constitution. And I think Eastman believes is that the legislature can still say we made our decision. We stood by it, but we lost So let's undo our decision and simply say, no, no, no. It says we can always have that choice. The Constitution says it's up to us to select the method. And that includes declaring that we had our fingers crossed when we chose the method the first time. And now we get to select a different method, a second bite at the apple. There's nothing more un-American, I think, than this idea that we'll hold an election, listen to the people. But if the people don't say what we want... We'll just do it all over again. But we won't do the election over again. We'll simply select who we want. You have the right to have an election and to have your voice heard unless we don't like your voice. Right? That's just never going to fly. But Eastman's whole theory depends ultimately on that actually being what the founders intended in the Constitution. And there's no way in hell they intended that. That's insane. Not even King George III himself the ultimate tyrant would have believed that that was a wise, rational, and rational way to go. The vote is if you don't like votes, you don't like votes. Don't hold them. But if you hold them, you can't just say. I mean, it's almost a hundred percent better to say, "Well, the vote was held improperly, and so therefore illegal, and that's why we're doing." It. That's much better cover. But Eastman says you don't even need that cover. You just say, "Meh, we changed our minds." So, I mean, that's pretty incredible. There's another thread that goes into further detail about this that I thought I would share with you in the time we have together uh, that I think helps explain some of the mathematical craziness Eastman was trying to do. Angus Johnston is the author of this thread, a historian, in other words, a PhD in history, like Doug Mastriano, a historian and an advocate for American student 
activism. How do you like that? Historian of and advocate for American student activism at the City University of New York, CUNY, as they like to call it. Eastman, he says, isn't just talking about throwing out votes here. He's he's holding up uh, Kyle Cheney's tweet about his Politico piece about Eastman's newly discovered uh, memos and emails. Eastman isn't just talking about throwing out votes here. He's talking about estimating the ratio of Biden to Trump votes in categories he doesn't like, then reducing each candidate's tally according to that mathematical estimate. Do you remember we were just reading it here in the TPM piece, the the most extreme uh, version of what got expressed or what was uh, reprinted here in the TPM one was, where was it here? Right. Why not just apply the historical rejection rate for ballots and then discount each candidate's totals by a prorated amount based on the absentee percentage that those candidates otherwise received? I believe Angus Johnston's thread here gets to that in the next couple of tweets. But if not, I'll come back to it. In other words, Angus says, he's proposing to abandon the idea that a vote tally in a presidential election corresponds to any tally of actual votes actually cast. He only said actually once there. In other words, I'm reading it again. In other words, he's proposing to abandon the idea that a vote tally in a presidential election corresponds to any tally of votes actually cast. It's just going to be an algorithm and I'm going to make it up. It really is kind of incredible to just see it in print. And he's quoting Someone else's tweet here, which has the right screen grab in it. Per the exchange, Eastman suggested that GOP legislators could simply cite their concerns with Pennsylvania's absentee ballot procedures and then use historical data to discount each candidate's totals by a prorated amount based on the absentee percentage those candidates otherwise received. It's still a little unclear, but I'm pretty sure he gets into it somewhere down the line. Uh, but as I scan, I don't see it. So maybe it was someone else that went with some, may or may not have it in pocket, but in case I don't, this whole prorated thing, in other words, they're saying this, uh, the, as it turns out, the rejection rate of absentee ballots was much lower in Pennsylvania's elections in 2020 than it had been in previous elections. Now, there's many factors that go into that, but the suspicion was, and in some cases this is probably true, was that the standards had been loosened somewhat, largely because of the pandemic and because many people who typically had never voted by absentee or whatever other mail-in method you want to talk about, drop box method, and never voted that way before, were likely to have some additional difficulty because they were first time voters or whatever, whatever the stresses of the pandemic were, were likely to cause things that could technically and in years past might have caused local elections judges or local boards of election to reject a ballot. But that this time around, they were a little bit more forgiving. Uh, And Eastman's theory is this is entirely inappropriate and illegal because in his view, The state legislature didn't say you could do that, and that's an erroneous interpretation. But on top of that, he might also argue, well, why the more lenient standards? Even if you don't believe the state legislature has to act in order to make this permissible, why change your standards at all? You should have to show cause why that's permissible. And if you don't, then something, something, and it's all illegal. But what ends up happening is he's arguing, all right, So this time around, they only rejected 1% of ballots. And usually they reject 5% of ballots. And he suggests that whole thing, right? Why not just use the historical data to discount each candidate's totals by a prorated amount? He's saying, why don't we just say, oh, the historical trends are probably more likely what is true. And the more forgiving... uh, Uh, standards that allowed only 1% of ballots to be rejected are probably wrong. Why don't we reject 5% of ballots instead? And because it was his guess that much, many more of the ballots cast by mail were pro Biden than pro Trump, 
5% across the board of rejection rate would probably net more rejected Biden votes than rejected Trump votes. But I mean, on what basis do you do that? It's ju just, you know, because they also might very well have just gotten better compliance with the ballot rules among people. And they just did much better because there was a lot of consciousness or awareness raising going on, especially in Pennsylvania, trying to teach people how to properly cast their ballots so that they didn't fall subject to this rejection rate. We don't actually know for sure why the rejection rate was as low as it was. We have some guesses about it, and some of them are probably substantive, but it doesn't matter. Eastman says, doesn't matter that people were more educated about how to cast their ballots, and it doesn't matter that they decided under their own authority that was granted to them by the state legislature in some cases, the ability to lower the standards or change the standards or whatever. Doesn't matter. And we don't know. But you can't just go around guessing, well, people meant to screw up their ballots, but didn't. So let's throw them out. So Angus Johnston's uh, thread continues. It is kind of incredible. He says, just to see this in print, Eastman is a former law school dean and Supreme Court clerk, by the way. Some of you may remember that in 2000, there were a bunch of weird votes for Pat Buchanan in Florida, specifically in one county, Palm Beach where the ballot was designed in a weird and confusing way. You remember the butterfly ballot? In 2000, Pat Buchanan, a rabid right-winger with a record of crypto-Nazi views, got a super weird spike in support in Palm Beach County, a heavily Democratic, heavily Jewish jurisdiction. And there really are, by this point, since this was back in 2000, plenty of uh, like full-grown adults who are very politically aware, who don't actually have a personal memory of this happening, so it's worth recounting. But for the rest of us, ugh, it's like a bad memory coming back up. This spike of votes for Pat Buchanan corresponded with and was to a statistical certainty caused by a ballot design flaw that could lead people who thought they were voting for Al Gore to vote for Pat Buchanan instead. This ballot design error cost Al Gore the presidency. It did. It just flat did. Now, Bush was certified the winner in Florida by 537 votes. And a reminder from our earlier story, certified by the Secretary of State of Florida, 537 votes in all of Florida, certified by the Secretary of State. Who was the Secretary of State? His campaign chairman. Just keep that in mind. It is estimated that Buchanan was credited with 2,000 intended for Gore votes in Palm Beach County, 80% of the election day votes that he received there, 80% of his Palm Beach County votes for Pat Buchanan turned out to be statistically very likely, very probably, almost to a statistical certainty, 2,000 of those belonged to Al Gore. Had they said, well, obviously the intent was, and we should prorate and move those 2,000 votes from Pat Buchanan to Al Gore, that overcomes the 537 vote deficit. Al Gore wins Florida. Al Gore wins the presidency. We know that Buchanan was not the intended recipient of the vast majority of his Palm Beach County votes. We are as sure of it as we can be. We could have brought people in and asked them after the fact, who did you, is this your ballot? Who did you vote for? If we were able to match them up as they're trying to do now with the Trump votes. If we were able to figure it out, they would have said, oh, yeah, I absolutely intended to vote for Al Gore, not uh, not Pat Buchanan. But it doesn't matter. They didn't even try to do that because that's crazy. The votes were cast, the votes were counted, and the election went to Bush. People still argue about the decision to stop counting ballots, about intimidation of elections officials, about the bizarre reasoning in Bush v. Gore. But nobody argues that those Buchanan votes should have just been given to Gore. Well, I mean, sometimes we wish that, but nobody actually stands up and argues that. And that's a good point because we all understand that you can't say, well, I estimate that X percent of these votes were improperly granted to candidate Y. So I'm going to change Z votes in the final tally to compensate. Because if you do that, your election is no longer an election and you no longer live in a democracy. And in the Florida 2000 case, the evidence that Buchanan got those votes in error was overwhelming. 
No such evidence exists in the case of the 2020 election. So yes, it's a power grab. Yes, it's an attempt to overturn an election by invalidating legally cast votes. But it's also an assault on the whole idea of voting on the principle that one person casts one vote and you determine the winner of the election by counting them up. Eastman's memo says, don't count them, discount them, the actual opposite of counting them. Don't bother counting how many people voted for Trump and how many people voted for Biden. Start with the outcome you want, reverse engineer it, say Trump won. That's legal because my stupid theory about the plenary power of the legislatures, which is completely wrong and no one has ever espoused, and there's no way in hell that the founders thought that that would be how things would come up, despite the fact that they had designed the upper house of the legislature to be selected in exactly that way. But that also means that they know exactly how to engineer national, federal level elections so that they are determined by state legislatures, and they did not do that with the presidential election. Anyway, I thought uh, the TPM story and Angus Johnson's thread help shine a light on just how crazy Eastman's theory really is. NetworksRadio.com. I hope you got it too. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Walton. Well, if you didn't, or you're just sick of it, then stay tuned for Justice Putnam, who will bring you the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy next. I don't know that this is necessarily on the menu, but we know that there's always a valuable and delicious selection from around the country and around the world available to you next for the next hour so do stay tuned we'll see you on friday to give you i don't know more garbage